And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most fast and, and most mass shit way possible. Ah, I already screwed up my intro. <laughs> I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. Coming to us straight from the Dice Tyrants, the creator of Aether and Steamworks, which is now kickstarting a 1.5 edition. The one and only Tyson Bruce. I'm hoping I got that right. It was butchered. It's Burris, but thank Burris. you anyway. <laughs> Well, I, I see that, and I keep and I keep thinking, is is this going to be one of those cases where I got to roll my R's because I can't do that? <laughs> no, it's it's Burris. Uh, it actually, it's a last name that's been used and kind of mangled from some of the original ones. It means from the burrows. We used to be coal miners way back mm -hmm. in the day, mm -hmm. you know that kind of thing. So, yeah. yeah. Oh. So. So thank you for having mm -hmm. me, by the way. Yeah, and <laughs> thank thanks for coming on and. <laughs> Well, I would say braving the hell that is time zones, but, um, but you're not that you're not that far off from my, from my region, so it's not so, isn't so it wasn't too much of a it wasn't too much of a journey. Yeah, it's not that big a deal for me. Right mm -hmm. in the middle of the afternoon for me. Mm -hmm. Oh, pl plus it's it's not like one it's not like one of those other side of the planet kind of things. Yeah, um, like you're gonna get up before in the morning just so you can have this conversation. <laughs> Well, it's funny you mention that because whenever I have to, whenever I have to watch um, um, pay, um, pay per views of Japanese wrestling, I have, I have to watch them during Japan time, which is interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, different side of the world. Yeah. So, it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings. Humble beginnings. With that in mind, walk me through your um, introduction to role-playing games and what was it that made it a uh, stick? Okay. Uh, well, first off, I've been role-playing since I was eight years old. Um, I guess the first ever introduction I had to this form of game, to a degree, uh, was Dragon Warrior a long time ago, now called Dragon Quest here in the U.S., mm -hmm. always Dragon Quest in Japan. Uh, that, of course, being a regular video game, I got a Nintendo Entertainment System a long, long time ago, started getting into to RPGs there, and then I immediately went into making my own games using Legos and those little figures and stuff. My brothers and sisters and I would get around, and mm -hmm. I'd give everybody a certain amount of health and how far they could move and that kind of stuff. And then um, my father, my adopted father at the time, he was a big uh, first edition Dungeons & Dragons fan. He had, like, a closet full of old books mm -hmm. and uh, he, while he wouldn't let us play i did watch a while and then when ad and d came around uh we started having family get-togethers and stuff and we started playing then um that was right around like i said about eight years old mm -hmm. um from there i went on to consuming pretty much any kind of media possible related to it i read all the dragon lance novels i read uh all of the the drizzit series um from the beginning for from ra salvatore uh, of course, any fantasy books that I could after that point, you know, going through Lord of the Rings and uh, The Hobbit and all those kinds of things, moving all the way up into to Harry Potter and stuff later in mm -hmm. life. Um, so I've been very entrenched in fantasy for a really long time. I've yeah. played, I've played a, a Dungeons and Dragons first edition, AD and D, uh, three, three point five, four, and five. I've played uh, a whole bunch of different other game systems by white wolf like mm -hmm. empire of the masquerade multiple editions a bunch of the, the games that are in that universe the exalted series um i dabbled in some some of the little known or lesser known uh ttrpg stuff like uh, big eye small mouth which lets you play mm -hmm. an anime character kind of weird riffs palladium fantasy a whole bunch of different things yeah. and um made my own game <laughs> Took me almost three years to get 1.0 out, and it's taken another year for me to update it into 1.5, which I believe is really more of a, a finished and polished product, even more so than the last one um, that I put out now. Now, before I get into the next serious question, I do have a couple silly ones that I need to ask. Um, first, <laughs> when you mentioned when you mentioned diving into a bunch of of different um, fantasy books, I do have to ask the question: How much coffee did you need in order to read through the Wheel of Time? Oh my god! 
I had many, many days where I fell asleep in the middle of reading that series. Uh, Robert Jordan, great long distance writer or long distance, long, long term, like planning and plotting writer. And mm -hmm. uh, ooh, what was the other author's name? When he... um, um, the guy who finished it up was uh, Brandon Sanderson, who Brandon Sanderson. Yeah, which I, I want feel whatever like drugs he's on. <laughs> <laughs> Sanderson's works really did pay good service to Jordan. Mm hmm. And they were written in a way that was a little, I think it was a little quicker to follow, but um, didn't have quite the same feeling of scope and scale that Robert Jordan had, in my opinion. But yes, uh, probably 10, 20 gallons of coffee a book, maybe. Yeah, I um, it wasn't too long ago that I had um, I had Stephen Long on, and he meant he mentioned that he did not enjoy the experience of doing research when he did the uh, Wheel of Time D20 books. Yeah. Um, I actually made I made a D uh, D10 system Wheel of Time uh, hack that friends and I played at home for probably about a year, which was yeah. cool. Um, se second, since you mentioned um, since you mentioned Exalted, I'm guess I'm guessing you've got at least six pounds of um, d of ten ciders um, yes. laying around. I, you know those <laughs> this I, they've almost become a meme themselves, but those purple Crown Royal bags. You ever see those? Yeah, um, I think I get. I think I got one of those that I keep my dice in. <laughs> yeah, they, I've I've got three of those full of D tens and a little box. I got a um a cigar box from my father in law one one Christmas uh, as a gift, and I don't smoke, so I filled it full of dice and figurines. It's a uh, pretty sizable. So yeah, I've I've probably got three or four hundred D tens. Yeah. Um, I to be on to be honest, I prefer I prefer the when it comes to the the type of dice bag that that would end up being preference. I always end up asking myself, okay, which one of these would be less painful for me to get hit with? Because, <laughs> yeah. um, one of my players a long time ago had a um had a chainmail di had a chain linked ah, uh, dice bag. I was gonna um, say, and um. It it had it had a nice weight, and he also had put he also had pewter dice because he did because he let I guess he was overcompensating for something. And um, one unfortunately one day his his wife storms the, his wife storms the table and decides to throw the nearest thing on hand, which happened to be that dice bag full of dice. Ooh. <laughs> Twenty pounds of dice hit you in the face. Yeah, miss. He missed him and hit and hit me right in the face. I'm, I'm just I'm just holding my face like what the hell. <laughs> I, I got it lucky. My wife plays all my games with me, so she would never think of throwing our dice and pewter dice. I mean, I have friends that have metal dice. They have a variety of different metal dice, pewter dice, and glass dice. And I have glass tables, so anytime people come over with those, I'm like, can you just use some of mine or roll on the floor or in a dice tower? Or something, because I don't really want to have to break or chip anything today. Yeah, I, um, especially especially since I, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure the old superstition applies as much at your table as it does at every other table I've been to. That um, you don't roll other people's dice because that's bad luck. Mm hmm. People say that. I mean, I touch their dice anyway because I'm usually the GM. Then then they get all freaked out. I curse them all, and then we have interesting sessions. Yeah, well, the dice gods are the dice gods are merciless. As I as I've often as I've often said, and I want to put this on a t shirt one day. Jesus saves, R and Jesus doesn't. <laughs> um, That's why we called ourselves the dice tyrants. I mean, the <laughs> dice are tyrants. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, when now, in a less silly um spin of spin of things. Where did where did the um, idea to do something like Aether and Steamworks come along? Because with some of the games that you've that you've mentioned, a lot mm -hmm. of the ones that you bring up don't necessarily lend themselves to a uh, steam to a steampunk influenced um, background. So I have been a huge fan of airships from the Final Fantasy series mm -hmm. forever, right? And one of my most uh, integral games developmentally as i was growing that stuck with me the most was final fantasy 7 which is a mixture of magitech and airships and you know this these grand stories um so that always kind of sat on my mind a bit and from 
different sections of my life, I also draw on some ideas that I had had before. So I played the heck out of Fallout 1, Fallout 2, right? Which were, mm -hmm. you know, top-down view games, not this 3D stuff that we have now in the new the newer versions. And a whole lot um, less jank. Yeah, <laughs> uh, with, with some really interesting ideas. It's a game mm -hmm. that really lets you kind of feel that almost that RPG experience, that TTRPG experience way back in the day, mm -hmm. where you could be like, I'm going to walk off into the woods to the southwest, and then, oh, crap, there are monsters here. There are, you know, uh, Brotherhood of Steel members wearing full power suits with miniguns, and now I'm dead. Oh. I guess maybe I shouldn't go that way. You're, you're, probably, um, you're probably familiar with, um, with Fallout's origin, aren't you? Uh, to a degree, yes. It's... Um... Originally, the, originally Fallout was going to was going to use the same mechanics as GURPS. GURPS, yeah. Um, but for one reason or another, the deal fell through. Yeah. And they created special. Yeah. Yeah, I actually used GURPS to re to create a hack for Fallout at one point, um, which was surprisingly easy because they didn't change a whole hell of a lot. Uh, but it was different enough. But anyway, so I, I was invested in those games. I was invested in Final Fantasy, and then uh, one of the studios that had made some of the Fallout games went off and did their own thing after contracts ended called Arcanum of Might and Magic Obscura. Have oh, you ever seen that? I've, I have. It, it's, I consider it good, but I, also, but I also consider it a little on the unforgiving end of things. It was difficult. It was very, <laughs> very hard. And, I mean, it had its fair share of problems, but the concept always stuck with me the idea of this technology society steampunk strange you know adventure magic against uh, science type thing um stuck with me for a while as well so it Aether and steamworks is a an amalgamation of a variety of things that i've liked in my history and it originated actually as a module so we had been playing a lot of 5e modules recently we had been um, playing a, a host of other, we'd played Exalted for a while, for like a year. And we were looking for, I was looking for a new setting to GM for, for my local group. Um, and I started thinking up, you know, brainstorming some ideas. I'm like, well, maybe I should go with, maybe I should go with something Redwall inspired. You know, people like that kind of thing. There's, I, I have never played a game in that variety before. Maybe, maybe I'll try that. And then I'm like, well, I don't know, maybe maybe something a little different. What have I not played in a long time? And I thought, well, I haven't played Eber Eberron in a long time. Maybe something along those lines. And I'm, then I'm thinking, well, it doesn't quite fit exactly what I want. And I go to my wife's work one day, and um, I'm like, I'm looking for something everybody wants to play, something not everybody's tired of. What should I do? And she looks at me, she's like, you'll think of something. And as she twists her head, she's wearing steampunk earrings. And I'm like, I should do something steampunk. <laughs> Um, so I start creating a campaign in a steampunk world in, in 5e at home. And I start developing worlds, and I start developing the people that live in them. And then I start looking at 5e and going, you know what? I don't like some of the restrictions that 5e puts on people. I really like some of the freedoms that the D10 system provides. I really like some of the freedoms that some of these other games have in their social constructs and some of their narration you know and in the way that some of the games work so what would it look like if i just modified my game a bit and i started working on uh, little changes mm. to the way that 5e would work in the case of uh just saying i want to add this i want to add that and eventually that turned into this doesn't work for me the way i need it to i need to make my own um so then like a madman i sat there and i wrote and like didn't pay attention to my family and uh, neglected everyone around me and all my friends <laughs> for like a year and a half until I had written out Aether and Seamworks. This, it's, it's its own thing. If you play it, you know you're playing Aether and Seamworks because every class, every race, every character you're going to create is tied into a narrative in that system as well. Um, from the very moment that you make a character, you will immediately know who they are, how they would react in certain circumstances, where their place is, in the Empire, in the Aether Sphere, where everything is. Um, and then I thought, you know what? Any good TTRPG really needs art. <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and look into how much it might cost to start adding art to my book. And then I went, oh my god, I am not rich enough for this. Um, because art is very, very expensive. 
one of the artists that I had quoted for just one piece, like a like a one page um, uh, concept art for for one of the worlds that I was on was quoting me somewhere around a thousand or two two thousand dollars in between. And I went, OK, well, maybe I'll just do it myself. Uh, I had been a portrait artist for a while. I had done little cartoony stuff here and there. And um, I found uh, XP Pen Pros, which are like a new type of the new quote unquote new type of digital tablet. Um, and I went, you know what? Those aren't that expensive right now. Let's go ahead and get one of those. I will start practicing more and more digital art and things like that. And uh, over time, I ended up creating that, putting it in the game. I tried to launch a Kickstarter before, but I really wasn't prepared for what that meant uh, a year ago and wasn't it was not a good Kickstarter. It ended up failing relatively early. And um, I got the game put on on uh, drive through RPG anyways and struggled for months and months and months to try to figure out how to get a book printed because they have some really specific um, specifications on how the book should be, what its bleeds should be, what its margins should be, what the color formatting should be, what types of images can go in there and what cannot. I finally got them to accept one of my hardcover book options. And then I had them print it and they sent me a proof and all of my images were black because they didn't, they didn't process pro appropriately. Um, so my book is, I've got a copy of my book here in the house with like 180 images that are all just black boxes. <laughs> um, at that point, I, I looked at it and went, this is going to be another, you know, month or two months straight work fixing this, readjusting all these, sending them back out. I guess we're just going to keep this a PDF for now because my family's going to disown me if I keep neglecting them for longer <laughs> than this. Because I don't, I don't have a crew. I don't have anybody else to do any of this with. I've had to edit everything myself. Uh, my wife tried to help me with that, obviously, but she's working full time for the city that we live in. And it's not like she has any kind of real time. Um, and I couldn't afford it to pay anybody for it. So again, I edited everything. I did all the layouts myself. I did all the art myself. And then I'm like, fine. All right. It's going to be a PDF. And then I got invested really heavily with Dice Tyrants. I'd already been, um, been doing shows and stuff with them for, for like a year at that point. And uh, then... You know, we, we get closer to our second season of Aether and Steamworks, and I'm like, you know, there's a few things I can do now. I've been practicing art pretty much continuously. Like, I, I think I draw and I make things at least once a day, every single day, always. Um, so my, my skills had improved quite a bit, and I went back and I looked at my book and I went, oh, this is awful looking. <laughs> you know, new eyes, longer term, late, late bit. And I said... I think uh, I should upgrade this. I really, I really deserve it to, or owe it to myself if I'm going to push this out there really seriously, that I take it very seriously and that I give it the best possible chance that it can get. Now that I have the skills that I have here, I'll go ahead and I've adjusted my style. It's more of a cartoony style to it now um, because the world of Aether and Steamworks is kind of like that. It's like a over the top uh, heroic fantasy to a degree. All of your characters will have a whole bunch of powers they can use. They'll have a lot of ways to get out of trouble. You'll rarely get hit. You know, that kind of thing happens. Mm -hmm. um, but when you do, it almost inevitably leads you towards death. <laughs> it's, it's a very punishing combat system. You don't want to get shot. It's bad. Um, but your chance at, at overcoming that and not getting hit, not getting attacked, not getting damaged, is, is very high based on uh, resource management. So if you're careful with your skills, be careful with your abilities, with your reroll options, all that kind of thing, you can get out of a lot of circumstances and it leads to a lot of situations where people just aren't cheering like crazy because they just narrowly avoided after a couple of rolls, basically having their head taken off, you know? Um, so, so I went back and I revised the art, replaced a bunch of it, actually have uh, InDesign experience now so I can actually make the book in a much more clear format. So it's easier for me to update and change and, you know, move around things. Uh, it's easier for me to actually do my placements. And now I am 80% of the way through the book. I still need to go back and do editing, obviously. I'm probably going to add a few more bits of art here and there because I can't stop doing that. And then uh, it should be out in hardcover this time, hopefully before December, although with COVID being what it is. Um, I'm still using DriveThruRPG right now. They are the least expensive 
the variety that I can get out there. I don't want to have to spend sixty dollars out of pocket per book and then charge my my customers, you know, a huge arm and a leg because of what I've got for them. Mm -hmm. um, but with them, it takes up to a month to go through the proofing process, maybe maybe two months, and then it takes like two months because of COVID to actually send a book to somebody. So um, I'm hoping I can get it out there before December, but it's it could be between now and like the middle of next year that the that the actual physical copies make their way out. But I'm get I'm guessing the digital ones would pro would probably shoot for December. Uh, the digital one. Oh. Any of those individuals will get a copy of the PDF. As soon as I'm done with it. So I won't even, you know, I'll just send those straight out to those individuals. But everybody else will be getting it once I've got it all set up on DriveThruRPG. And I can go ahead and uh, do the mass email setup through there and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that that will be there. Everybody will have that in hand as soon as it's finished. It's just the hard copy that's going to be potentially problematic. Mm -hmm. Now, you had, you had mentioned... Um... You had mentioned using Five E as a base during it during its early incarnations. Mm -hmm. So, what I'm cur what I'm curious about is you admit you had mentioned before t about how there were s about how there were restrictions within Five E that you weren't a fan of, and yeah. I'm curious if you can give me a few examples as to what some of those were that were in conflict with what you wanted to do, and what you tried to do to address those particular um, issues. Okay. Well, first off, 5e is kind of punishing when it comes to your role options. One example of that is stealth. Stealth is a huge problem in 5e. Uh, unless you have like a very lenient GM or someone who's very aware of it, you get one stealth roll. If you get it, you're now sneaking. If you're sneaking and you, and you continue moving through a dangerous area, quite often your GM has you make another stealth roll. If you roll more times... The chance that you're just going to fail is there, and then that's it. You're out of stealth. No other options available to you. Um, in Aether and Seamworks, you do have rerolls. They're called aces. There's also um, virtues, which give you reroll options. There's there's a variety of skills that will enhance how you can roll. That will mean that even if you fail at something, you oftentimes have the tools necessary to kind of twist fate a little bit and make sure that you can still succeed in certain circumstances. So D&D uh, &D does have, you know, advantage. You can get an extra die to roll, but that mm -hmm. doesn't change the fact that even if you have advantage, you, you say your GM says, uh, okay, well, it's nighttime. The guards in this household are all asleep. You're good. I'll give you advantage on your stealth roll. You make it, you move through the location, and then you step into a new room. And suddenly he's like, well, there's two guards in this room. Go ahead and make your stealth roll again. Um, you no longer have advantage. So how are you going to, what is that, what difference did that original role make? Because you had a higher chance to succeed anyway. Um, so that's, that's one potential problem. And it's not just, just in the case of stealth. It's also in things like combat. You're in combat, you're, you're a mage, you have your fire bolts, you have your fire balls, you have your lightning bolts, you have your arcane missiles. You have very specific spells that do very specific things. And if someone wants to come out and say, hey, I want my fireball to become an ice bolt. Maybe not a big deal to change. Maybe you can have some house rules around that, whatever. Mm -hmm. But it still functionally works exactly the same. Um, in my game, if you're a mage, you know how to bend magic to your will. So if your character is someone who is very good at using elements, instead of just making a bolt of flame that fires out, maybe you create a wisp of flame that wraps around someone's shoe and comes up in a different direction. Or, you know, you actually have a lot more flexibility in how you use your spells and how you craft your spells and what you want them to do. Um, I've had players, you know, freeze over doors and I've had players set things on fire that could explode over a short period of time. And I've had the ground swallow up enemies or lift people up above where they're currently at because they can't quite reach where they need to get to. Those are all things that I feel like wizards and sorcerers should be able to do in 5e. They're, mm. they're capable of magic, especially sorcerers. That's innate. That's stuff that they, they somehow just know how to use magic. But all of them are so restrictive in what they're doing. And I, I get that. Understand, I understand why that is. Uh, having a very restrictive system means it's easier to balance how you want your game to work, especially in a tabletop setting or if you're, 
if you're a combat simulator mm -hmm. type game, right? Yeah. Um, but that's that's another flaw with the game too. If you go into a social encounter with the Baron of such and such, your firebolt no longer is really going to serve much of a flexible purpose in that building. <laughs> uh, it's still going to be potentially combat related. You could say, well, I punctuate the points by shooting a firebolt into the air and it smashes a chandelier, but it's still not functionally what you can do with it. If, if you're in the same circumstance uh, in Aether and Steamworks and the Baron such and such comes up and he's he draws a pipe out of his pocket and just light fire onto it for him or you know you could cool a room down to try to help calm other individuals that are there as, as again these are just examples related to elements uh, my magic also includes the ability to use mind tricks a la mm -hmm. jedi it's got healing individuals it's got time and space manipulation where you can tell a little bit about the future uh powerful time and space mages bank rolls uh every resting period where they've seen into the future a little bit and then they can use their knowledge to impact the scene. They give that role they have banked to an ally or an enemy. So you roll a natural 20, and it's like, well, my ally got a bad role. We really need to overcome this circumstance, whatever it is. Here's a nat 20. You just really succeeded, you know? Um, so being able to be more flexible in those regards was important to me. I want to be able to tell stories that make people feel like they one have player agency and two that their characters are special when you play fifth edition you get that feeling if your gm provides it to you most of the time but the system doesn't do it on its own you have a very specific role you're going to be playing and if you're a fighter you're going to be up front if you're a barbarian you're right out there trying to tank for everybody if you're a mage you're standing way back in the distance bobbing fire if you're, you know, a ranger, you're either up close with two blades or you're standing way back firing your bow as often as possible. There's very specific roles that each one of those character classes are kind of uh, based around. And the same thing for classes, or races, excuse me. Races fit better certain classes specifically, always. Mm -hmm. In Aether and Steamworks, that's not the case. So you, you could choose to be a human uh, as one example, which is the most flexible in most games, you know, humans are flexible, um, but they have their own base abilities that could be useful in, in any uh, class. The same thing for dwarves, the same thing for elves, the same thing for halflings and Skixen and Lezrin and kobolds and goblins. All the different types of races all have very, very unique abilities that make them play their classes differently from one another when you, when you choose to make one. Um, the next big problem, this is one that I really have an issue with, is turn stagnation. Uh, if you're in combat in D&D, &D, you quite often, if you're, if you're not somebody with a whole bunch of versatility in their kit, mm -hmm. like if you're a, a rogue, if you're a, a fighter, I mean, fighter's variable. There's some versatility they can have if you're like a battle master versus a, you know, whatever. You can do certain things, but you get into combat. You rush up to the enemy, and nine times out of ten, you attack, and you add some personal flavor, and that's it. Your turn is over, and now you need to wait the 20 or 30 minutes before it's your turn again. Which turns into a lot of people sitting around tables at home, having side conversations, or staring at their phones, or just kind of, you know, falling asleep on the couch waiting. In uh, online games, it can sometimes be worse than that. I mean, you can completely lose a player... To the internet <laughs> because they'll have their turn and they'll know they're not going to be up for a long period of time and they'll switch over to the other game they're playing on the side because it's the only way they can keep their attention from you know dragging them out of the room um aether and steamworks has uh well, well D, D has bonus actions which allow you to do some extra things on your turn in aether and steamworks you have reflexive actions and you can gain multiples of these by the time you get up to max level reflexive actions can be used on any turn yours your allies your enemies and each one of those has some very specific uses and you have some abilities based on your class and sometimes your race that you can use reflexive actions for uh one example is an alchemist kill skill called walls from anywhere mm -hmm. that allows you to clap your hands together slam your your fists onto the ground and cause a wall to erupt up within a certain range and it can be used to hinder the progress of an enemy or defend an ally, or intercept a bullet shot, or you know, give you a, a leg up so you can jump out of the way of something or over something else. Um, all very 
customizable skills and all very much a reason for your players to stay engaged at all times because they can assist their allies at a ver at, at various times in combat or they can protect themselves in a way they wouldn't normally be able to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. So <clears throat> other than that, um, I wanted to reduce some of the complexity of some of the systems because ultimately it's a game and most of the time you're looking at a dice roll as an example of do you win, do you lose? <laughs> I got rid of things like, uh, uh, what is it called? I think as you level up, you have a static modifier in D&D 5A that I can't, mm -hmm. it's eluding me right now. Um, um, proficiency. Your proficiency. Your proficiency modifier, not necessary in Aether's Teamworks. The vast array of skills, again, not really necessary in Aether's Teamworks. You have your seven core attributes, your seven, seven core statistics. And every one of your roles is based off of those. If you have one brains, if you have to make a lore-based role, if you have to do something related to intelligence, you will get plus one to your role. If you have minus three, you'll get minus three to your role. And all of these roles are modified by benefits or distractions. Um, if your character has a whole bunch of positive benefits, maybe they had a, a really great meal, maybe their allies are being super beneficial to them, maybe they have a, an ability active on them that is giving them a leg up. That immediately just grants plus ones to them. Uh, distractions, same thing. If you're injured, if you happen to have poison in your system, if you're standing in a cloud of gas, if your character has a massive headache, <laughs> you know, a variety of other things, you get distractions, and that takes away from you. And a variety of, uh, of abilities and skills in the game, well, not just skills, but a variety of abilities and other roles in the game will either add to or subtract from these distractions, which gives you a better chance or a worse chance of success depending on what you're going through so it's a much simpler system when it comes to roles and your allies have a chance of assisting you and benefiting you as well uh, from a gm's perspective every one of your role targets your rt which is kind of like difficulty for for D, &D mm -hmm. um is based on how complicated that thing that you are trying to do would be for your character um, so your GM says, okay, well, your character is from the backwoods of Miocenus, never been to school a day in their life, and they're trying to remember uh, advanced algebraic mathematics. So that person's <laughs> role target is going to be a lot higher than the university alchemist who's been doing it their entire life. Yeah. Which means that the person that happens to have the best experience in the past uh, history with something is likely to be more successful, although it's, you know possible that somebody could get lucky <laughs> oh the di the dice gods giveth and they taketh away and they taketh away um but yeah you can you can store up to three aces in aether and steamworks you get one every single episode and one if your gm is feeling generous at any point in the game maybe you did something really cool maybe you brought pizza for the entire group maybe you know um Maybe your acting in an RP scene was just so grand, they'll grant you an ace, but you can store up to three of them. So any of the players that are out there that are really careful can store these, plan them out, use them against the, the most dangerous circumstances, and give them the best chance of success. Yeah. Now, when it comes to... Now, you've... When it comes to this new... When it comes to this upcoming 1.5, mm -hmm. um, did you refer to it that because... That because because it's more of a director's cut of your original work? Basically, yeah. I mean, it's it takes the original works and expands on them in some ways and takes a look at the systems that may or may not have fit exactly how I wanted them to work mm -hmm. and either simplifies them or balances them out in a way that didn't exist in the previous works. Um, it's really moving the game in a direction that I think is simpler and easier to grasp with the depth necessary for you to develop really powerful games in it. I've also added a section for GMs specifically, because I know that this is a new system for individuals and they may be floundering on where to go with it, that talks them through how to set up the games, how to play them, what different uh, lore details there are for worlds and factions, how to use your monsters, how to, you know, how to create bad guys on the fly, that kind of thing. Um, all is just kind of a, a primer to how to play the game. I'm also setting up a, a YouTube channel. Well, I have a YouTube channel. I'm also setting up a YouTube series that'll talk about how to play the game, what it's all about for individuals who are more of an auditory learner than, than visual. Mm -hmm. 
Now, when it comes now when it comes to the when it comes to the classes, one one thing that I definitely noticed um, mm-hmm. is the fa- is the fact that in a lot of game in a lot of games that use class based systems, there's the temptation of having that one chart that just shows everything, but instead you s- at least for the 1.0 version. I'm not this sure if this is going to um, carry into 1.5. Mm-hmm. You ha- you had it where um, each level gets like a pa- gets like a pages worth of mm-hmm. what of what that is going to entail. Yeah, I-, I felt like that was a little bit messy in 1.0. 1.5 has been adjusted. So when you level up a class, the first thing is is that all classes have four core abilities that mm-hmm. they get, which will be useful throughout the entire game, no matter what level you are. And abilities in this game were designed to be like that. So if you get a level two skill or level two ability and you want to use it when you're level 13, 14, maximum levels 14. Um, it will still have relevance. It'll still benefit you in some way to do that. It'll Some of them will increase in power over time, that kind of thing. Um, every time you level up, there are four abilities. It's, it's one sheet or one page. It tells you what you get stat-wise for going up a level. And then there are four abilities you get to choose one of. And uh, they're all powerful abilities so there will be a little bit of a you know i have four choices but all of them are good which one am i supposed to take that'll help to drive replayability for one and two will make you think about your choices and who your character specifically is uh so they're very unique as you level up all the way towards end game um i like the idea of having a page denoted to each one of the level ups so that you can really get a good example of what what it looks like as your power your character's power levels are increasing. What do you get? What do you do? And I do like the idea of personal choice in my games as well. So again, as you level up, you get a choice every single level. You get to choose not only do I want to level my class, would I like to level my race? Races have their own specific uh, power up skills as well. Mm-hmm. And that also adds another a uh, Another uniqueness to a character that you create because, uh, you know, an elven battle scarred is going to be different than a Humi battle scarred is going to be different than a dwarven battle scarred because all of them have the option of skills that don't exist to the others. And when it com- when it comes to when it comes to that, that does bring me to my next question, which is how how do you feel about multiclassing when it com- when it comes to when it comes to Aether and Steamworks and just multi-classing in general? Well, multi-classing in general quite often feels like, in a lot of other games, a way to fill the gaps in needing a unique character direction. If you want to multi-class in a way so that you're no longer just a glass cannon in 5e as an example, you have options to do that. If you want to be stronger or faster or have some magic to do things, that's why you, that's why you do that in those games. In Aether and Steamworks... As you level, you kind of choose how you want to play the specific character that you have. One example of these, again, is in Aether Mages. Um, if you like to be the stand back and fire balls of fire type, you can go into elements, you can keep leveling that up. But if you want to get in close and personal, if you want to add to your own life pool, you can do that through uh, some level up uh, abilities in the life and mind categories. You can do that sometimes in the death and entropy category, which can give you you know, damage resistance can give you shields that protect you that can put you in a close combat situation where suddenly you're more like a, a spell blade than you are just a mage. Mm-hmm. Um, every single one of the classes in the game can be leveled in a way to pr- provide you one of the opportunities that you're looking for in how you want to play. The, that whole uh, idea of, you know, strikers and uh, defenders and, and, you know, those those different roles that are out there all exist in each one of these classes. If you want to be a character who can really jump forward into the front of combat, there there are methods for that. If you want to be somebody that attacks from behind or supports others or who moves people around the field, there are options for those as well. Uh, If you really, really want the flexibility of multi-classing in-game, there is one class that's specific to that called the Jack. Um, The Jack has an ability that they get every other level or so called of all trades, which allows you to take skills from a lower level from any class in the game so if you really are looking for like hyper flexibility you can choose that class and it's somebody who just kind of does a little bit of everything all the time Mm -hmm. 
Now, when it comes... Now, um... When it comes to... When it came to the whole idea of racial levels, was that something that was a offshoot of, thi of things like um, racial paragon paths and, thir and um, third? Because that's the main yeah. thing that comes to mind for me. That was an example of that. It also... You know, there's, there's a lot of um, discussion. I mean, the race in games quite often turns into this, this vast discussion about things <laughs> in the political scheme. And um, when I was thinking about how I wanted to develop the game, I did want to draw on some options that really defined who these beings were, why they were the way they were, and what differences they have that kind of delineate why you would want to play them in general, rather than just making some sort of simple template for everything it could have gone with one race but i didn't like the idea because high fantasy is fun mm -hmm. <laughs> um having a lot of different choices and having a lot of uh, exploring a lot of narratives surrounding uh what it is to be these people and the tribulations and problems they come up against yeah so when i started looking at that i thought what is another way to bring a unique spin on the game what is another way to give people more options if they want them and to explore exactly who these these beings are and how their lore works. And I thought that increasing increasing their levels specifically is is power them up. This is what a dwarf is. As they become stronger and wiser and more powerful in these ways and weaker in those ways, what does that look like? Um, so I implemented racial levels as another way of kind of making your character unique as you level them, like specifically for that reason. Uh, I wanted it to feel different every time that you played so that you could I'm like I'm the kind of person who will go into a system like uh, I played World of Warcraft for a long time right mm -hmm. um, every single one of the classes I leveled all of them up to max level at the time every single one of the the races that were out there I tried once or twice here or there but they never felt different enough to be interesting <laughs> um, and I would be the type of person who would multi-class or not multi-class but uh, respect all the time because I like that I like that chaos. I like that little bit of difference here and there. I, I have an ADHD mind enough of the time that I need something to be different once in a while in order to continue enjoying it, right? So I've gone back through and I've played Dungeons & Dragons. 3.0 the most, 3.5 good, 4.0 eh, not that long. Probably not quite long enough to give it the chance that it deserved, but I did not like the system. I, I was already playing World of Warcraft. I didn't need it at my tabletop. Um, and then 5.0, I've played for, I don't know, two years, maybe almost three years. And I've done everything. I've played all the races. I've played all the classes. And while my campaigns aren't generally as long as some others go, I'm playing a lot of them at once, um, which means that, that everything started to feel stagnant to me. How many elf rangers can you play? How many variant human fighters can you play? You know, the, there's a certain amount of these that are consistent and the only way to really get beyond that is by going out and buying a whole bunch of expansion books you know getting more information from other creators and saying oh well maybe i'm going to play a purple knight uh fighter mm -hmm. this time or you know whatever it is so i wanted to develop a game that in itself has so many options available to it that it would be really hard to grow bored with it over the course of multiple campaigns yeah now when it comes to when it comes to um uh, when it comes to the ma the magic question um mm -hmm. now give, given what given what i've seen given what i've seen of how um how magic works within within your approach um i think it's fair i think it's fair to say you had no interest in doing any doing any sort of um spell charges a la d a la d and d um, not exactly. Um, in 3.5, it's, or 3.5, 1.5. In 1.5, it's become simplified a little mm -hmm. bit, but in 1.0, um, I have this thing called Limit. Limit is the amount of magical energy you can absorb into yourself before it becomes damaging. Think of it like overindulging in something, and then you get sick if you have too much, right? Yeah. Um, every time you use a spell, you draw in Aether to do so. You draw in magic. You use the part of the magic that you need, but then you have leftover sitting in your body. So this is called your overload. Your overload rises every time you cast a spell or use an ability. 
Once you reach your limit, it starts causing physical damage to yourself, which means that you begin trading health for spells or abilities. Um, so it's kind of like a mana pool with your own life eventually becoming part of how often you're going to be willing to cast a spell. And that, mm -hmm. that was something that uh, came from the idea of using two magic being damaging. I mean, I, I read a lot of Dragonlance, like I said, and you see... You know, Raslin Majir, he cast his spells and then he'd cough up blood and fall on the ground because he just used too much of his own life. Um, so in 1.5, it's simpler than that. It used to have like a, ver a variety of costs and things like that for everything you were going to do. In 1.5, it is just one per one. Every ability you use, every spell you cast, everything costs one overload, just increases by one. When you reach your limit, every point you are over is one health that you get taken away. So if you're one point over, you take one health. If you're two points over, you take two health. If you're three points over, you take three health. So it goes up very quickly um, if you decide to keep casting spells afterwards. I, I had one player in my most recent session who almost killed himself because he just kept using abilities. But it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a trade-off, right? You want to succeed... So do you use your hit points to do an ability that'll give you a better chance of succeeding or do you just, just decide not to use it and try to use, you know, no skills and just, just get away with dice rolls? Yeah. Um, for, what it, for what it's worth, when I mentioned the spell charge thing, obviously I was talking about the whole spells per day thing that D&D &D does. Spells per day, which, yeah. Um, which, to be, qu to be quite honest, I be I've... Um, I've yet to encounter a, sit a situation where I actually liked that particular system. At best, I've tolerated it mm -hmm. over the years, Sim simply well, because um, it worked. That kind of thing is one of the is one of those offshoots of D and D's roots. I think it is absolutely. I I am also not a fan of that because really it limits both creativity and it limits fun early in the game mages can do like one or two things and they can't do anything else and have to rely on the rest of their party which mm -hmm. is why they implemented cantrips to be to be perfectly honest so you still have an option um in aether and steamworks you don't really have that uh you gain back or you you disperse your overload it goes down mm -hmm. uh, by an amount equal to your regen per hour so some characters have two or three regeneration uh, at level one. So it only takes you like an hour of rest or two hours of rest and you're back in the fight again, um, which me leads to a lot of games where you're pretty much always able to do something when you start and when you're going forward, um, which my players have said that feels really good. They always feel like they can do something. They're never stuck in a situation where they're just going, well, I'm out of everything and I'm just going to sit here and, you know, stab at stuff with my knife and hope that it, I'm successful or throw darts at it long distance or hide in the back and and fire arrows or rocks. So, yeah, I, I agree. I did not like spell slots, and I don't use them. I do have a, a mechanic in place, though, that acts a little bit like what using a spell slot above the one your spell is determined for, called Chaos Magic. Yep. You, um, you double the cost of a current your ability you're using, and as an Aether Mage... It effectively doubles one aspect of it, increasing the range, increasing the damage, increasing the area that it impacts, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you do that, there is a chance <laughs> that something bad will happen. Um, on a natural five or lower, you have to roll on the chaos table. And there's like, I think there's 50 or 60 different things that could occur. And uh, it can lead to some really interesting situations. So we had... Um, we had characters being attacked by a Kachet, a sand serpent, giant snake on the world of Rulo. It was trying to eat one of our new players who had just joined our campaign. And um, they were getting in this fight with it, and one of our Aether Mages uh, goes up and decides to try to attack this thing, but does something outside of the purview of the regular spell and decides to go use Chaos Magic. I need my spell to reach further. I need to be able to hit this character. Mm -hmm. She does. She fails her roll. She has no option to re-roll, so she has to roll on the Chaos Table. She does so. And doubled the size of the enemy, giving it extra health, extra attack damage, <laughs> all of that. And suddenly something that was just a challenging encounter becomes a really dangerous encounter for everybody in the party. Nice like, job oh breaking God. it. Yeah. Um, so I I've, had, uh, I've had players trade places mentally with monsters. One of our mages became the troll that they were fighting. 
temporarily, which turns again into a, a role play moment. The troll is now mentally inside the body of your ally, so you can't really attack him, right? Unless you feel like it's okay to kill your ally's body. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it switches back after a short period of time, but during that moment, it throws everything into disarray, and suddenly people are trying to figure out how to how to deal with that. Um, but more often than not, because again, it's only a, a one in four chance, uh, it creates a bigger effect for the spell that you're trying to accomplish, or trying to use, or the ability you're trying to use, that kind of thing. And um, it's just, it, it's wonderful. We've created our own emote for it and everything in our our uh, our stream when everybody starts trying to play, should I do chaos magic? And then we see everybody that's watching start <laughs> going, chaos, chaos, chaos. It's fun. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when when it comes when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the classes within, um, mm -hmm. now I'm I'm assuming that with that within them you're you intend on you intend on making it so that instead of having a bunch of different classes you you want to shoot for um, having each class um, have a good amount of um, variation within it. Yes. I have a uh, as of one point five. I have a total of eight classes mm -hmm. and each one of them plays a little bit different than the others each one of their abilities are unique for that class and really that's all i necessarily want to have although i'm not against the idea of uh, when i make my world books in the future maybe introducing more classes um but really i want it to be so those core classes are really all you would need to play any game in the future because of the variance in skills and abilities uh, because of the the uniqueness of each character as you create them, and because they are often a Swiss Army knife, so you can make them to to do whatever you need for a group. I, I had one uh, character recently have to decide between doing more damage or being healing and beneficial to the party or getting advanced notice in the case of things like ambushes and warnings, and you know they had to decide, okay, what's going to fit what we need right now the best and what is going to be the most useful for me based on our campaign in the current circumstances. If they're playing a game of political intrigue, obviously maybe throwing balls of fire isn't as helpful as, you know, being able to, to tell what next move your enemy is going to make. Um, and then if you're playing something like a survival horror style in the void dealing with a thallium, suddenly you're like, well, I'm going to need to make sure I can use lots of fire. <laughs> Well, if it, if excessive force doesn't work, you're not using enough of it. Yep, and creativity in your skills too mm -hmm. is is helpful. We have one character who's playing a noble, and uh, in the new edition, nobles in the old edition, I was not happy with the way the system worked for them. In the new edition, you have uh, a house that provides you with this technology that can give you, you know, new a benefit or abilities or benefits. You have a lot of money that a lot of other classes don't have, so you can buy more modifications and upgrades. You can augment yourself with like mechanical parts. You can become basically a Tony Stark type if you wanted to. Um, and as you level up, you determine with every level up what your house is known for, what they're good at. Did they work for the military and have access to airstrike teams that can drop down automaton war machines that'll help you fight in combat? Uh, in the middle of anywhere, basically. Or do you are you a merchant house that has a, a Deguile Bucks on every corner? Um, one of our characters decided to use the merchant house thing, and the ability that they have is, no matter where you are, you can run into one of your house's um, supply trucks, basically, that comes by and, and offers you beverages and offers you things that you need, but you can only do it a certain amount of times mm -hmm. every few episodes. So you can't use it every session. It would have to be used like once every third session or so. So you have to use it sparingly and carefully. Um, it's very powerful. It gives people lots of regen back. It's a good place to get your health back, to resupply if you're in an area where you're out of food and drinks, as an example, or uh, you really just need that safe location. But he used it as a weapon, because <laughs> of course he did. Um, he summoned his house's uh, refreshment cart and rammed it into a ship to cause some extra damage uh, that helped the crew win their engagement. The problem is that when he destroyed it, the house that he, he works with as a noble was mad at him. Every time you do something the house does not agree with, like something relatively big, obviously, it's not just like 
oh, you had toast on a Sunday and we don't believe in that. Um, it's a big thing. You get demerits. If you receive three demerits, your character loses all of their special benefits for the house. They have their own like little yellow tag uh, benefits in each one of their level ups. And that includes things like money and resources and local support with law enforcement and that kind of thing that they would normally get being a noble. Um, so he had to choose between, okay, do I do this thing? Do I get a demerit? Now what do I do to get rid of the demerit? My house contacts me. They say, you need to save this merchant vessel. It's under attack by pirates. Go save them or we're going to still be angry at you. Uh, so he takes the crew out and he goes out there and he gets into this fight with them and helps protect the other ship, which if he had failed would have had its own you know, mm -hmm. problems. And so there's, there's a lot of um, role-playing driven narrative that can come specifically from being a class in this game as well. Yeah. And then of course the flexibility to use an ability, however you want. <laughs> now, one of the, one of the things that I did that I did notice with the um, with the game is is the concept of the Aether Sphere, um, mm -hmm. multiple planets over overing over a um, sun. Which for something like for something like this, given given how um, steampunk is is um, very prevalent within Aether and Steamworks. Um, I find the idea of of multiple planets within this kind of interesting because that's not something you tend to see a lot in in works that are focused on steam tech. Traditional steampunk, yeah. A lot of a lot well, of times it's centered in just in just one particular area, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And you've got a full on system with its own with its own um or with its own orbiting um, planets. Yes. Um, the 1.5 edition has stepped away from direct steampunk into aetherpunk, so it's a little bit more magic-focused technology mm -hmm. than just steam-focused. Um, but yes, I have seven different worlds. I have, uh, magical airships that can travel through space. We call, it's called the Void. Uh, there's a binary star system at the heart of this that, you know, kind of has this clockwork mechanism that makes all the planets move in the right way mm -hmm. and all of this kind of stuff. Um, so it's, it's a powerful aesthetic and I got, I, I'm, I've watched a lot of shows and movies and media and things like that, that I enjoyed quite a bit that maybe didn't get quite as much, uh, fanfare as they should have. Things like, uh, you ever watched Treasure Planet at Disney? <laughs> yeah, Treasure, that particular film had its, had its problems, but I will, I mm -hmm. will admit I enjoyed that, um, for the concept of what it was trying to do. Yeah, it's... the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. The aesthetic got me. That the airships flying through space, this interesting kind of technology involved in it, that got me. I didn't mm -hmm. really like the story. I didn't, learn, I didn't like the movie as much as maybe I could have. But um, but I love the aesthetic, the idea behind some of that. Yeah. Um, and of course, there's there's some off the cuff kind of strange and kooky steampunk meets space out there relatively recently too. I mean, I I. Uh, I'm a fan of Steam Powered Giraffe. Have you ever heard of them? Yes, I yes I have. I've um I think I believe I've seen them live a couple times. <laughs> um. I love their music. I love their concept. They did the music for uh, a game called Steam World Dig and Steam or Steam World mm -hmm. Heist, not yeah. Steam World Dig, um, which was really just these steam powered automatons inside of spaceships in space, and it was it was this turn based game uh, that was very quirky and fun. So mm -hmm. I had just come off the back of that playing it. And I, when I had originally started developing the world for it, I thought, why not make something that lets people play in whatever setting they want as well, without necessarily having, having to be a systems agnostic game. Um, so I developed the, the universe of the Aether Sphere in that, that theme. If you go to a different world, you're going to have an entire different theme involved in what the role play on that world would be like. Um, Avalon, the, the central hub world, is this overpopulated city stacked on top of city, ancient monarchy, so the, the elven forces used to own this before the Empire took over, um, with, like, hidden technology, and you've got all these, you've got this very specific class-based system uh, of uh, social, like, social ladders, basically, mm -hmm. where the nobles sit in their white alabaster towers on top of the rest of the city where the middle class can still see the sun where the lower class are down in the dregs of the world 
uh, with toxic gases coming up and in control of protecting the engines and things that make everything else work and run. Um, so if you're playing on Avalon, it's almost like steampunk meets cyberpunk. You've got these massive corporations, which are the nobility that control everything and control where people go and what they do. And they play these games of thrones on their own, trying to maneuver into positions of power within the empire, which is still relatively new in this area. So that's, that's Avalon. That's the main world. That's where the most technology is in the game. That's where uh, it's like the central planet that kind of extends out where everything else goes. And then you can see there's Silver Shield, Rulo, Eris, Hornborn, Myosinus, and, and Zither. And each one of those has their own uh, factions to it. Silver Shield, which is now the seat of the Empire, mm -hmm. uh, they've created a, a large citadel there for themselves. But in general terms, Silver Shield is in the middle of this mithril rush. Mithril is an anti magic material, it's what helped the uh, dwarves fight and win against the elves. Um, Silver Shield is full of mithril, but not it hasn't been claimed yet, it hasn't all been found. Uh, so it, it's more of a Wild West meets steampunk uh, gold rush type setting where people will go out into this untamed wilderness they you know bring their horses and they bring their critters and they come out there and they try to pan for silver <laughs> for mithril um they try to find what they can and they try to, to create societies of their own in this savage frontier um obviously without the whole problematic savage part that's not mm -hmm. the thing um i'm get i'm guessing that the re the reason why um it's still ca it's still fairly gold rushy in that area is because there's a lot there's a lot of um threats when yes. tr when trying when trying to get when trying to get at um, mithril that there and, is. that uh, and people doing the whole i i saw it first so it's so it's mine and then the shooting starts Yes, there's most of the conflict on Silver Shield will above surface come from other other races that are there trying to get it as well. So you end up with these really personal stories of I saw it first, I'm going to shoot you down, uh, nobody's going to know you had this claim, I'm going to take over it. Um, one of the main uh, quests that we played, or one of the most recent campaigns we played in there was in the city of Danholm, which is right off this place called Coffee. Uh, Jorgen Coffee is a is a baron in the southwest who creates these massive plantations of coffee and sends them all over the aether sphere mm -hmm. and uh works and tries to control the communities in the area which are kind of lower on resources and tries to get mithril and, and he created his own empire there since there's no this is full of lawlessness you end up with these warlords and these barons basically that are like this is my territory anything you find in it is mine and now that gives you you know a reason to to have a campaign there how do you deal with this warlord is he a is are they a good person are they a bad person do you fight them do you not you know those are those are all questions you would ask if you're on that world um then we have rulo which is the home world of the orcs uh they are a interesting group of individuals who have come from goblins they originally evolved from goblins they happen to have uh, a social pecking order based on on honor stories which are Anytime that an orc does something that is beneficial to their their people or to the people around them that are that is socially beneficial, they receive honor stories. And the more of these that they have, the more social clout they get and the more they're recognized for their deeds and their service to others. And then they become the leaders of the, the communities that they're in. Rulo is incredibly dangerous. Um, every single creature on the planet can kill you. <laughs> uh, even plant life is trying to do so. It is very barren. Uh, there's very little water. And the struggle comes from the environment being hyper dangerous. It's home to ogres, which are like a halfway between the ogres and 5th edition and like giants. They're right in between there. Um, it's home to trolls, which are one of the only nasty races that actually legitimately exists in the world they're a hungry and selfish race that pretty much just constantly is trying to seek food and and sport by tormenting others um they were a, they were a created monster uh in the past by <laughs> some individuals who are not yet written into the book that have been hinted at that'll be in future um future expansions all right anyway uh go ahead um, one thing, one thing that I'm cur one thing that I'm curious about, if, the, if just fr just from just from a semi outside perspective, is whenever I th whenever I think of of um, steampunk and now and now ether and now ether punk in that regard, um, mm -hmm. 
the cust- the term customization always ends up being a battle cry. Yeah. To the to that end, um, I'm cu- I'm curious if there's going to be some work done when it comes to customization for weapons and armor. Yes. Uh, every weapon and armor has modification slots. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a certain amount that you can put on something. I mean, if you have a piece of armor and you add too many things to it, no longer does it work. You know. Um, so each one of the, the equipment, each, each piece of equipment in the game has modification slots and they act kind of like magic items do in other games in like d and stuff like that. Um, you can do things like add the ability to add jets to your boots so you can fly farther. You can add grappling hooks to your, your gloves and your armor and your weaponry. You can change your weapon to fire from firing bullets to firing lightning. Um, so there is a whole modification section and there are rules on how you create your own modifications and what those should look like in the GM section um, that will indicate basically what the guidelines are for when you're being inventive. Uh, one class, the Tinker, entirely is, is built around the idea of creating inventions. Their abilities allow them to make things for other players or for themselves that nobody else can use because they're too complicated. <laughs> um, or adding modifications to things, upgrading people's armor and weapons and the standard equipment and their vehicles and all that kind of stuff is all part of the game. Mm-hmm. Now, to th- now when it comes to when it, the other thing that I'm cur- the other thing that I'm curious about, and I'm get I'm guessing this is something that um can't that. You can you kind of hint you kind of gave me the hinting of when you were talking about the when you're talking about the void, um, mm-hmm. with with all the stuff that you had been di- that you had been digging around through when it came to doing research was Spelljammer one of those things? <laughs> yeah, yes, it was. Um, like I had kind I had kind of sus- I kind of suspected, especially since you met you mentioned starting with early D anD D, so. Mm-hmm. And yet, given that you're going for more etherpunk instead of steampunk here, yeah, my mind immediately went to Spelljammer because that's kind of, that's kind of the go-to of that particular style. Yeah, when it came to steampunk, I found it being a little bit too restrictive. Um, the technology being not quite as good as normal, maybe close to it, that kind of thing. Uh, and and the steampunk, steampunk communities haven't been incredibly. Um, inclusive like when i've tried to do this i've gotten a lot of back and forth this isn't actually steampunk where's your edisonian where's your tesla where's your blah 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 oh in all the the whole the whole um design by gospel kind of thing yeah so since my game is kind of designed in its own way but takes some elements from it i have not gotten a lot of positive feedback from those communities which made me think well maybe my game isn't exactly steampunk Uh, anyways and from the way I wrote it from the very beginning, magic was such a big part of it that mm-hmm. I was like, well, you know what? It, it probably isn't. It's it's a little bit of both of that. It's the steampunk aesthetic with magical technology that is... On, I'd say that my game is on technology par with a good cyberpunk game uh, without computers, you know, with the ability to travel between worlds and things like that. So if you're wondering where that tech level is, uh, with some notable uh, restrictions, because of the way that Aether works, it breaks down certain components faster. Things decay faster than others do. So, mm-hmm. like, your traditional oil-based economy doesn't exist because there isn't... Uh, the Aether decays it so rapidly that it becomes basically dust. It doesn't have the time to become oil. Things like certain types of oxidizers for your for your black powders don't exist. So they use something that in this game is just called spark powder, you know, the precursor to your t- traditional black powder. Mm-hmm. It creates a lot of smoke. It creates a lot of problems. It, it reduces your ability to oxidize, which gives me a perfect in-game reason why firearms can only fire once a round. <laughs> so we don't have machine guns in this game. I think um, I think it's also a good I think it's also a good workaround to make sure that to make sure that um, melee weapons aren't treated as obsolete. Absolutely. So a lot of my skills will get you up and close and personal will do things like protect you from ranged attacks. So guns are not the primary source of, of weaponry in the game. It's a mixture of whatever you want to have. Shields, you can literally block bullets with. Um, you know, you have things called ping on your armor, which completely nullifies ranged attacks sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so there are positives for using your ranged attacks through firearms and there's negative aspects for it. And I, I do actually give that whole gun culture uh, a little bit of a nod in that there's this uh, manufacturer war kind of going on in Aether and Seamworks between um, Addison Arms uh, and uh, a couple of other ones that are out there that I can't think. Uh, <laughs> uh, give me one second here because I'm haven't had enough coffee this morning you talk about it earlier today and um so harkins true shot edmonton arms and addison arms are the three major manufacturers of of firearms and technology and each one of them have a have a very unique way in which they critically fail that, that's something else that i brought to this system that was an argument that i've had many times over in gm discussions and table talk that kind of thing that happened on some of our uh, live streams right you have individuals come on and we discuss it it's like there's this argument over what can critically succeed like and what can critically fail. Mm -hmm. where, are, where are your botches? Where are your crits? And from my perspective, I want everything to have that chance. Rolling a nat 20 should be awesome always. And rolling a 1 should be horrible <laughs> always. Um, in 1.5 edition, it's been expanded. In, in 1.0, it was just there's always an outcome and it describes roughly what you should look for. In some weapons, uh, they have a very specific outcome if you critically fail, like an Edmonton Arms weapon will explode in your hand. That causes damage to you, but you get a reroll on your attack and it does double damage if you hit this time. So, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a play out there. It's like, well, if it screws up, I no longer have a firearm, but I potentially kill my target and then I can fix my gun later and that's fine. Um, Addison just jams, so you have to take a turn to fix it. Harkins uh, fires in the wrong spot because they're known for extreme accuracy when you critically fail. For some reason, your sights weren't lined up, mm -hmm. and now your attack goes five feet to either side of your target, hitting anything in the way. So you could hit your allies, you know, uh, or if it's passersby, civilians, whatever. Um, so critical failures in 1.5 are done in this way. You have a choice. Your GM will ask you, okay, you got a critical success. Do you want this to impact what you were directly doing, causing extra damage, making it easier on you, giving you some sort of benefit? Or do you want to do something that benefits your allies? Maybe you hit the uh, armor strap on your opponent, causing their armor to be reduced significantly because you got a critical success. It doesn't do extra damage, but it makes it easier for your allies to help. Uh, critical failures are the same way. Do you want to do something that directly impacts you negatively? Or do you want to do something that impacts your team? Maybe less than what you would have taken yourself. It gives you choices again when you're playing. So we had an example of this um, in our uh, Dragons of Rulo campaign. We have uh, characters playing on that world, that very dangerous world. And they've just accidentally, some of them, I guess, maybe not accidentally, accidentally killed some livestock that they were supposed to be gathering and bringing back to, the, to a nearby village. When those creatures die, since this world is so dangerous, it's so full of creatures that are looking for sustenance, that are looking for moisture, that the outlying creatures start moving in on the death. They can smell it, scavengers come in, it becomes problematic. Uh, the one character that was on watch, Zeta, was walking around and looking and saying, all right, I'm gonna keep an eye out. If anything tries to creep up, us, uh, up on us, I wanna catch it before it does. We don't wanna be taken by surprise. She rolls her aware roll has no additional options for re-rolling, and critically fails. Go away! Sorry, I'm pushing buttons I shouldn't be pushing. <laughs> I've got a bunch of different... I've got a panel here. Um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> just... just <laughs> curse, curse at you. <laughs> um, anyway, so Zeta goes to look around. I have her make an aware roll. She rolls, critically fails. She has a choice of taking some additional damage from something. Maybe she trips down a hill. She lands on a cactus, something. Or um, she could potentially impact her abilities, capability, their allies' ability to also be aware. She had already taken some damage in combat. She wasn't doing so well on health. And she's like, I don't know if we do get ambushed. I don't want to be set up at this position where I'm going to be in danger of dying, you know? So she's like, well, I guess I, I impact my allies. So we role play out the scene. Her character is being dramatic, is being loud, is hot in the sun, has gotten sand in her eyes and in her clothes in places, and she's got wounds, and she's just being belligerent and irritating, causing all of her allies to have minus two to their roles 
to also be aware and to potentially avoid the ambush that is coming. None of them succeeded after that. <laughs> They're ambushed by these creatures. They have another fight that comes on and it's a little more dangerous than it would have been before. Mm -hmm. So one example of where critical failures and critical successes, uh, how they're supposed to work in the new system. Yeah. Now, going from 1 to 1 1.5, were there any mechanics that you can think that you can think of that um as t as through that years worth of of testing and iterating didn't quite work the way you intended? Um let me think here. One overload, I didn't like how much extra math people had to do, which is why I reduced it down to just one cost per ability. Mm -hmm. So that was that was a quick step. I also changed movement from being in feet to being in units. Um, one unit is equivalent to roughly five feet or 1.6 meters or, you know, one square on a map or one hex on a map, whatever you're using if you're using a combat map. Um, that way it's a little more friendly to overseas individuals because I actually had a lot of people on my Kickstarter that, that ended up becoming part of it that are not from America. Um, and I wanted to try to make it as easy on them as possible as well. And to reduce the overall numbers using, if you're, if you're trying to think about or imagine what 50 feet is, how many of us are actually accurate with that anyways? If you say, well, he's five away and you only have a range of four. It's like, well, I can move forward just a small amount and I can do what I need to do, you know? Um, other than that, I did not like the way nobles worked before. And I also needed to balance out some of the ways that character classes and races work together um so that i didn't have people who were I, I don't want to look at the i know it's still going to happen but i did not want to have an opportunity for someone to min max in a way that was unfair and that mm -hmm. was always the way most people are going to want to play a system so i had to go back and adjust some things for that because i had some starting characters that would have like twice as many health as everybody else at the beginning of the game and some that would have way more uh damage and strong so they could like lift trucks and stuff at the very beginning of the game when they balanced themselves or when they created their characters in very specific ways so i had to adjust those as well um i've also made a couple of minor tweaks to things like uh, i have something called the equivalent scale uh it's for gms Instead of needing like a massive bestiary, which I will still include in each one of my books, some of the monsters and some of the, the, the factions and things like that, some of the types of threats you're going to run up against so people have an easy place to pull them from. But I have what's called an equivalent scale that gives you the ability to make enemies pretty much right away on the fly without like hours of work and without having to memorize everything they can do. Um, you have simple, challenging, elite, and nemesis level enemies, and they have a stat block for them. No matter which ones you get, they'll all have roughly the same. And then they have a, a selection of these are the types of abilities they can do. Maybe your your simple soldier happens to have a grenade on his hip. Then he can use that in combat at one just one time, you know. Or maybe your nemesis enemy has the same exact skills as one of your players because they happen to have fallen the same path of, of uh, character development. So they're also an alchemist and they also happen to have worked at the university for years. And they're also an archon and now they're fighting you with the same techniques you have. Um, so that system is in place so that no matter what level your characters are, you can craft uh, a scene for them instantly. And that was something that I needed to adjust, obviously, to make sure that it, it balanced properly. And that's mm. the biggest problem I think I have come up against when it comes to writing a TTRPG is balancing. And I know why so many small indie studios all try to do these rules light systems, because then you don't have to do any math. <laughs> Um, um, I'd say, I'd say it's a bit of that and a bit of, I think some, I think some people have, um, have rose, co have rose colored themselves into romanticizing the story part of the RPG end of things. Yeah, Plus there's the, it, there's the rise of more story game like affairs, which is a whole other can of worms. Well, I, I love the idea of having story be a little more central. That was, a, that was one mm -hmm. other problem that I had with 5e, was that they don't have a lot of abilities directly tied to, to story. You don't have experience points gained for finishing out a really cool story mm -hmm. scene. Um, my game is designed around the idea of milestones, primarily. I mean, you have different choices, too. But the milestones yeah. that I'm talking about are you need three milestones, and you go up a level. And a milestone is granted anytime you've done something significant, pretty much. And 
there's the opportunity for the GM to say to one member or two members of your party, hey, look, if you kill those doing dong, those those livestock from Rulo, I'll give you a milestone because your your character would want to do this. And then it leads into a little bit of drama between the parties. They're like, well, we want to save it and you want to kill it. And whichever one succeeds gets a little bit of an advancement towards our level. <laughs> yeah. And um, now the other now one of the things that I did note in the Kickstarter was mm -hmm. that you had you had said that you wanted to shave the book down to um, to just three to around three hundred pages instead of three hundred and sixty. Yeah. Um is a, is a lot of is a lot of that shaving down just in just in um getting rid of unnecessary space with um formatting? Yeah, it's a mixture of formatting and fluff. There was a lot, a lot of flavor text that I put into everything in 1.0, which I think lent it charm, but also inevitably was rarely ever read and took up a lot of space after the first time you look at it. Um, probably, it could probably lead to, to um, continuity lockout. Totally. So I have reduced a lot of that. I have moved uh, a lot of lore base, like very detailed lore based stuff into its own chapter mm -hmm. so that you can go there and read it if you want to, where you can get the nitty gritty right up front and it makes it really easy to jump into a game without having to search through through you know a mile of text first um that's mostly it so it's it's formatting it's adjusting flavor text it's moving lore to a better position in the book yeah i can i can definitely get that now you had said that the now if if, if i'm not mistaken early on you said the pdf version is sl is slated for um, this is slated for December once all the once all the extra paperwork from Kickstarter gets um sh gets shuffled out, and probably yeah, early the, probably early twenty twenty one for the uh, physical. Yes, it should be the first or second week of December that the PDF is shipped to anybody that's part of the Kickstarter and is available on Drive Through mm -hmm. RPG. Um, and then the book again, hardcover, probably. I'm hoping late December, but most likely it's going to be like January, February, March of 2021. And I'll de I'll definitely be keeping keeping an eye out, and I'll be looking forward to when it um come when it comes around. Awesome. Um, thank you. Now, with that with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and and um enjoy the particular brand of insanity here in the monastery. Um, <laughs> well, thank you for having me on. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. And as I often say here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> uh, and of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>